So first of all, who am I? My name is Brian Colvert. Um, I've been doing FRC for 10 years, nine of those, or eight of those on 33, a year on 148, and then this last year I spent with 971. Um, my bread and butter is strategic design and detailed design, and then in the competition season, you'll find me doing match strategy and scouting, or sleeping in the pit, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, in, uh, when I worked down uh, at 148, um, I also had a chance to be on the VEX game design committee, right? So I spent five years there, um, and that informed a lot of the way I think about um, the way the games are analyzed and robot design. And then currently, I'm a mechanical design engineer at Oris Health, um, which I'm enjoying quite a lot. So these are the last three robots I was a part of. Um, there's not too much to say about them other than that they were fairly successful. And this, pro this process had a decent amount to do with that success, I, I like to claim. Um, all right, next slide here. So before I go too far, I want to note all of the other really smart people that have talked about this uh, subject as well, right? So Karthikana Gaspapthi, he's kind of the renowned uh, legendary mentor of 1114 um, for a long time. He gives a effective first strategy speech every year at usually at the World Championship, um, but you can find them on YouTube. I absolutely recommend viewing that if you haven't. Um, kind of in that similar vein, Mike Corsetto is the head coach of 1678. He gives an awesome strategic design uh, talk. Um, and then Adam Hurd has a, has a really nice talk about case studies on simple robots. And we've got some additional resources. But if you haven't had the chance to view these three specifically and you're here, you really uh, should take, take the time when you have a chance. OK. so. Um, Karthik and Mike talk a little bit about golden rules, right? So these are, these are just general truisms to live by when you're doing your strategic design. Um, build within your limits, focus on doing as few things as well as possible. Uh, stuff like that, right? And the thing I want to emphasize is that these are awesome rules. These are really good rules to follow, but they're also prescriptive, not descriptive rules, right? Uh, you can follow them without really understanding why. So part of what I want to do today is teach you guys how to fish a little bit, right? I want you to understand both how to analyze a game, and then at the end of the day, also understand why these, are, why these rules are kind of good ideas to follow. OK, um, so before the season starts, um, it's really important to define what your goal is as a team, right? Come together as a team, understand what you are striving for from the robot uh, performance side of things, right? And the thing I want to emphasize is that you know, the FRC game, it's the same challenge for every team, but the problem that each team is trying to solve is not the same, right? Every team has different resources that they're, they have available to them in order to solve this problem, right? Um, so when we're talking about, you know, a process-oriented goal, in general, I like to think that that's mostly the same for each team as far as you're trying to build the best robot you can with your resources in order to play the game as well as you can. Um, but there's also results-oriented goals, which a lot of teams uh, like to use. So you know, historically, the teams I've been a part of have been fortunate enough. We're trying to win the World Championship, right? We're trying to put ourselves in a position to get lucky, win the World Championship, right? That's, that's really the best you can do. Um, but I want to emphasize that when you're making decisions throughout the build season, you're doing it with this goal in mind, right? Um, it's kind of your guiding North Star, if, if you will. So uh, we've got our guiding, our guiding North Star. but. I also want to talk a smidge about what makes a good robot, right? What makes a robot successful on the field? And I like to, I like to reference what I call the triangle of robot performance, right? So ma this is kind of made up of three pillars. We've got strategic design. What, what is the robot actually doing in the match? Design execution. How well is it doing in the match? And then we've got operator expertise. This, one, this is the one that's forgotten the most often, but what percentage of the robot's functionality is being utilized, right? How good are your drivers? And uh, between these three, you are, you know, if you're, if you're putting emphasis on the right things, you'll end up with a really competitive robot. Um, two things I want to mention. So uh, design execution, doing that at a really high level, it requires a lot of resources and it requires a lot of expertise. Um, in the past, operator expertise, you know, it required a lot of practice. That was also difficult for, for everyone to do. But now with the new bag restrictions lifted for this next year, it should be a lot more achievable for uh, all teams to have a chance to drive robots between competitions to practice. 
But the thing I want to emphasize, and what we're going to be talking about mostly today, is strategic design, right? Strategic design, if you are willing to put in the time and be thoughtful about it, uh, you, can, you can execute strategic design at, quote unquote, like an Einstein level, right? You can do it at a really high level. Um, OK, so the other thing I want to mention is this robot performance curve. And I like to think about this um, with respect to planning out your season, I guess. So on the, the y-axis, we've got robot capability, right? How many points are you trying to score? And then on the x-axis, we have drive practice. And based on what you choose for strategic design and design execution, you're going to end up with this maximum robot scoring potential, right? And then depending on as, you, as your robot, uh, as your drivers improve uh, at driving the robot, they're going to start moving up this curve, right? So as you get a little bit of driver practice, you quickly jump up. And that's why driver, driver practice is so important. But, and what I want to emphasize, especially with the, um, the changing bag rules nowadays, is, is as you start approaching this blue line, you get diminishing returns with more drive practice, and it begins to be more advantageous to start improving either your consistency or the speed at which your mechanisms function. And so over the course of the season, what you ideally want to do is kind of set this as you come out of your six-week build season, start working towards this. And then as you start getting close, work on improvements to your robot to bump this line up. And then quickly, your line will, you'll kind of see a series of these curves throughout your season. And if you're doing, um, in, uh, in my experience, this is one of the best ways to kind of go through an FRC season, maintaining a competitive level and then getting incrementally better. So I wanted to put that out there. Um, OK, so the remaining, the, the remaining kind of meat of our talk is going to be on these main points. Um, breakdown, I have um, kind of a lot to say here. This will make up a lot of, a lot of talk. Bra uh, brainstorming, not quite as much. I think most people have a good handle on brainstorming. I have less novel ideas to add there. Planning, um, planning is more an exercise in knowing what to plan for than it is, you know, once you understand what to do, it's not so difficult. And then prototyping, I just have some nuances that I think I can add to your guys' prototyping, which should uh, incrementally improve it over what you may be doing. OK, so kickoff happens. Everyone is you know, watching the game. The, the video ends. What's the next step? What do, we, what do we need to do? Understand the rules. Sorry. So, in, I think most people kind of understand this, but it's difficult to overstate, right? The rules form the bounds within which your robot can compete, right? The, the bounds of the problem. And if you don't understand where those bounds are, it's basically impossible for you to find the best solution, right? Given your resources, given everything else. So uh, the metric that I like to use to determine if I understand the game well enough is, you know, do what do, um, I want to know what, what I don't know as far as unclear rules, right? If I understand the rules well enough to say, yeah, this rule actually has a lot of gray area, or this rule could be interpreted in multiple ways, that's usually a pretty good indicator that we've gone through the rules in a really thorough way. Thorough way. Um, and then I just have common rule points of interest. So match points, game and field elements, um, competition ranking points, robot and match play restrictions, stuff like how many game objects can you handle, those are all things that change dramatically between games. Um, so usually that's where the bulk of your effort's placed. All right. So let's say we've watched the game video. We understand the rules well enough that we now have a grasp of how the game's played. Most teams now tend to gravitate towards uh, brainstorming robot ideas, right? Once you think, I think this is kind of human nature, right? Once you think you understand the problem, you tend to, your brain starts coming up with solutions. But the way we're, uh, the way we're kind of trying to proceed, we're going we're gonna to try to break down the FRC game into its base components and then build it back up to try to find and analyze uh, the, the game for, for the best ways to play. So uh, the first step to that is identifying every robot action. Now, the way I like to think about this is imagine all the robots are just big black boxes that are just moving around the field, right? They bump into a game object, bloop, it disappears from the, into the robot, right? What, what's inside it, that's a problem for, for future us, right? We don't have to worry about that. So kind of within that framework, we're looking at everything that a robot could do. And usually this list is not as long as you think it might be. 
as uh, you, might, you might think it would be. Uh, but the important thing is uh, to understand with this list is that uh, one, uh, it's kind of, it's kind of um, each list is kind of fixed with the game, right? There's not a lot of room for interpretation. Um, if you forced every team in FRC to come up with a robot action list, theoretically they would all look the same, right? Um, but there's a lot of nuance in finding those difficult robot actions. Sometimes they're not intuitive, right? You might not think of it. So a good example of that might be, uh, this, is, this is a robot action list from this last year, right? So grabbing a ball out of the cargo ship in autonomous, right? How many people consider that as a possible thing that you could do? Uh, very few. Um, so the other things I want to emphasize with this, with this robot action list is every, every, everything that every robot will ever do in a match is somewhere on this list you know, in a sequence. And somewhere in this list, there's a sequence of actions that the best robot in the world will do. Right? So this is really forming the bedrock of our game analysis. Um, for best results, I like to, immediately after everyone kind of has an understanding of the rules as a group, I like to try to channel people's desire to, to like go into brainstorming and robot ideas into creating this list. I find that this list is a really fun, engaging way to, to begin the build season. Um, and in general, if you haven't done this, this type of list before, uh, people tend to be vague. So for example, you might say, uh, I want to score in the rocket, right? Well, that is actually like 10 different, 10 different robot actions. So you want to make sure you get in the weeds a little bit there. And then lastly, this, because this forms the foundation of your game analysis, you're going to be coming back to this a lot. Don't worry if you don't get every single robot action initially. You can always come back and keep adding to it. OK, so we understand the game. And we have created a list of every robot action that we could possibly do uh, within the context of the rules. So our next step is to, one, identify all the, the robot actions that score points, right? And then we want to work backwards and kind of create what I'm going to call a scoring cycle, right? So this is the series of robot actions that you need to do in order to score points. So here I've got two, two examples from this last year. This is all of the hatch scoring cycles within the driver control period and all the ball cycles. So for example, you, know, you pick up a hatch from the human player station. Then you drive to a scoring location, maybe rocket level one. And now you place that hatch on rocket level one. And then because we're making this a cycle, the robot has to start where it, where it ended. Or excuse me, has to end where it started. So we want to drive back to the human player station. Um, so yeah, the, uh, you want to work backwards, like I said. And then this will end up being kind of the second level of our game analysis, right? So we have our robot action list. Now we have a scoring cycle list. We want to make sure we capture all of the ways that we can earn points. And what I want to emphasize is most teams kind of think about only the actual action that earns them points. But in order to perform that action, you have to perform each of these consecutively, right? So picking up a hatch out of the human player station is as important as placing it on rocket level one, for example. And that's something that can't be overstated enough. Um, because this is rather complicated, you know, it's a lot, I'd like to break it down into buckets to kind of uh, make it more digestible. So some of the buckets I break scoring cycles into is autonomous cycles, driver control, driver control cycles, and then end game cycles. And then another way to look at this, which is useful, is infinitely repeatable cycles, right? Something you could do forever, provided you have the time. A finite cycle, something in 2019, most of the cycles were finite. You couldn't just keep do them forever. You could only do them so many times, and then you ran out of places to score. And then single instance cycles, that's usually end game type, type, end game type cycles. Um, something that usually is worth a lot of points, but you can only perform it once. <coughs> OK. So this is an example from 2019 of all of the actions that you need to perform in order to earn a solo rocket ranking point. Um, and what you'll first note is that it's a lot of stuff, right? 48 separate actions, 12 cycles total. And what I want to note is really important is as the number of actions increases to earn points or a ranking point, the difficulty also increases significantly. So even though 
for example, the other way to earn a ranking point in this game was to, to climb to level three on the HAB, right? So that was a more mechanically complicated problem. But once you solve that problem, it was only a couple of actions. It was only like three or four actions to get your robot up onto the, onto the HAB. Whereas this is effectively representing 48 chances for us to you know, fail or to slow down or to mess up. So that's where, that's where uh, the saying consistency is king and speed is queen comes from. Um, in FRC, consistency is look, absolutely the most important thing. And um, yeah, anything else I want to say about this? Mm, I don't think so. OK. Um, so we understand the rules. We have our robot action list. We have our scoring cycles. And now we begin to get into the meat of our game analysis. right? And what I want to emphasize here is that we're beginning to assess scoring cycles with respect to time. So um, a lot of teams like to just look at total points. And I find that that can sometimes be misleading. So if you, if you kind of frame this in terms of what is the most efficient way I can be earning points at any point in the match, and then if you're always doing the most efficient thing, it kind of follows that at the end of the match, you'll have the most points. That's kind of the framework that we're working within as we start to use this type of of analysis to uh, earn points. So each of these, each of these um, scoring actions is actually representing a whole scoring cycle. But I've, just for simplicity, I've shrunk it down to the final scoring action. Um, and in order to assess things based on points per second, we need to understand what the amount of points that each thing's worth is and how much time it's going to take. So first, in the game manual, they give us how, much, how many points each, each cycle is going to be worth, right? But it's up to us to determine how much time we think it's going to take. And that is where um, you can get into trouble with this type of analysis, right? So if you, don't, if you don't have accurate times for your different cycles, you can end up really uh, with a skewed, skewed idea of how the game's going to end up playing. Um, so where I recommend you go for that is, one, even though these, this is representing a whole cycle, it can be helpful to break down, you know, break down each each robot action and figure out mm, how much time do I think each of these is going to take. And then you add that back up. That's your time for your, for your total cycle. Um, I really, really highly recommend using um, old FRC games as reference material to figure out how long stuff takes. In most instances, um, FRC is not, you know, there's nothing truly new under the sun, right? So in most cases, you can find cycles that are similar distances, similar difficulty, right? similar, um, similar amounts of lining up, for example, that type of stuff. So if you can find um, a good historical reference, figure out how long that was taking teams back then, that's usually a really good uh, model for you to use in the future game. The other thing that can be really useful um, is if you take your, go look at, you know, go on the Blue Alliance, look at your own robot in old games. And that can also be you know, a good reference for yourself. Um, historically, teams' um, scoring averages don't change dramatically year to year. So, um, yeah. Uh, anything else I want to note? So, just to just to highlight this. So, scoring every everyone remembers scoring a disc this last year was worth two points. Scoring a ball was worth three points. And what I want to emphasize in this evaluation, right, is that. If, uh, if a ball took substantially longer than a disc, so say a ball takes twice as long, right? We could, we could find ourselves in a situation where even though discs are worth less points, if you were always scoring discs much faster than you could otherwise score balls, that would ultimately be the, best, uh, the, the most efficient way to play the game. So we're looking, for, we're looking for things like that in this type of analysis. <coughs> so here, uh, one of the things I like to do with this, with this uh, analysis uh, is try to figure out what the best teams are going to do. And I like to use that as a ceiling for uh, referencing all of the other uh, strategies that we're going to take a look at. So this is effectively a match right, of a robot. And each of these scoring cycles takes an amount of time. And then by the end of the match, we run out of time. Um, so these first two are autonomous. right? And then what we're, what we're assuming is that this robot, uh, let's see here. So this analysis was performed on a lot of different, uh, 
a lot of different potential cycles, and we figure out this is pretty much the most efficient one. Um, and what this is is basically a robot just cycling from the human player station very, very quickly. Right, so that's kind of what we, a, a fairly simple game, we kind of figured out, yeah, this is pretty much what you have to do to be successful in 2019. Um, yeah, so, and I want to note, you know, 50 to 60-ish points was roughly what we think the best teams in the world were going to score based on this analysis. So another way to use this type of analysis is to take the same, rather than taking a bunch of different uh, possible strategies and comparing them, you compare the same strategy but with different uh, levels of competency, so different times that, it, that each cycle takes. So this is an example. We talked earlier about discs being slightly less valuable than balls, three points versus two points. Because our assessment said that we can probably do them approximately as fast, if not balls a little bit faster, that is an indication that balls are actually the most, you, would, you want to score as many balls as possible and you want to do it as fast as possible, right? It's always going to be more efficient than discs. So uh, this, is, this is looking, you know, say, say uh, each cycle takes 30 seconds, right? We're going to score approximately 24 points. And then we can, we can look at this as, as our cycle times improve and figure out how many points we think we're going to score approximately, um, assuming, assuming these variables. And what I also want to note is that as this time approaches 15 seconds, we actually start running out of places to score. If you recall us talking about infinite cycles versus finite cycles, so this is kind of the most efficient way to play the game until you get to a certain level of competency. And at that point, you actually have to start doing more actions. You have to start scoring in other places in order to, in order to score more points. <coughs> so. You might say, like, this is a lot of work, right? We've built, we've bu built this foundation. We've, we have to find all these robot actions. We have to figure out all the scoring cycles. And ultimately, all it's telling us is, oh, we want to score balls faster. We need to score gears faster. In some respects, that's true. But what I have found historically is that this type of analysis uh, usually is good for telling us one or two things that are really important to the game, but not intuitive. So for example, in 2019, uh, we figured out that in order to be competitive, you know, at the highest level of play, we actually need to we need to somehow get more than one robot up on the the, the level three hab, right? And hopefully three robots. And so at that point, we had to make a decision between, well, are we going to lift those two other robots up there by ourselves, or are we going to climb up there by ourselves and then try to facilitate, right? Take up minimal space, try to facilitate other robots climbing up there. And ultimately, we were able to use this time-based analysis to figure out that it would be more efficient for us to put our effort into scoring really fast and a fast level three climb rather than um, the effort into this mechanical complexity of lifting two robots. So that, um, this type of analysis can also point out holes in the game that are not intuitive. So in 2018, um, if you ran this type of analysis, you might quickly figure out that capturing and holding the scale was almost a guaranteed win. It was very difficult to, do, to score enough points to, to win if you didn't hold the scale, right? So that was something that can inform your, decision, your robot decision as you move forward, right? Um, 2017 is another really good example of, of finding holes in the game that you can exploit. So in that year, shooting fuel was significantly less valuable than gears. And in fact, if you couldn't shoot fuel at a certain rate, so it was basically 40 balls in 10-ish seconds, you were, it was effectively net negative efficiency, right? It was actually, you were losing points versus the opportunity cost of scoring more gears. Um, so that was a really, a really important uh, observation that we made using this type of analysis that we otherwise may, may have not been able to find. OK, so the other thing I want to note about this type of breakdown and analysis of the game is that it's, you know, it takes a lot of work to set up, right? We have to do all that, the robot action list. We have to find our scoring cycles. But ultimately, because we have that groundwork set up, it's a, it becomes a really powerful tool to, and a really flexible tool to analyze almost anything that we want within the game, right? the structure of the game. So, uh, it's really useful for, excuse me, uh, it's really useful for all manner of different 
analyses that you might want to do. And then the last thing I want to note here is that um, it can also sometimes be useful for assessing um, functional requirements. So for example, that 2017 uh, game, if you couldn't score 40 balls in 10-ish seconds, it was not worth doing fuel, right? So when you're prototyping a fuel shooter, you have to keep that in mind and say, well, this is what we have to aim for, right? OK, so hopefully at this point, we've, understand, we've understood the rules, and we've done enough analysis to have an idea of the way we want to play the game, or at least different optimal ways to play the game at varying levels of competency. So now we want to jump, jump into uh, ideation, right? So we talked about the black box of a robot before. We want to pull the black box off and figure out what's going on inside our robot. And what I want to emphasize with brainstorming, I think most teams are pretty familiar with this process, but um, I, want to, I want to reinforce the idea that you want to get as many ideas as possible, right? Our greatest fear is that we, we you know, failed to come up with an awesome idea for a mechanism that would have, would have been amazing, right? So um, a great example of this would be 971 last year. Um, you know, we figured out that, oh, we want to take up minimal space on top of the hab. But we missed, we missed the fact that we could suction cup to the top and lift up, so taking up almost no space, right? So that, that um, because we didn't think of it in our brainstorming process, we didn't have the opportunity to prototype it and figure out that that was a good solution. Um, the other thing I want to emphasize here is that this is a really good area for people who are both experienced and inexperienced to add a lot of value. So experienced people add value with their historical knowledge of FRC and good solutions that have worked in the past. And usually, new people can bring novelty that sometimes experienced people will just dismiss out of hand. So for example, suction cup, it's never been good in the past. Why would we want to use it this year, right? And then I want to emphasize, in this part of the process, we don't want to dismiss ideas, right? That's going to be the next step. But in this part of the process, we want to just keep firing off ideas as fast as we can. So kind of going along with that, I have found that it's that it's really valuable to, um, to come up with question prompts to keep people's creative juices flowing. Um, and this is a really good way to, to, when people kind of stall out on a certain idea, you just say, hey, what about, what if we take this hatch and we figure out how to use rollers on it? What would that look like, right? What might that look like? So um, yeah, and it's all about everything that we're doing is in in uh, losing words here, it's in service of of getting as many ideas as we can. In uh, yeah. Okay, so once we think we have every idea that we can come up with, the next step is to begin looking at different robot architectures. And this is kind of what people tend to initially try to do right away. But um, once we have every idea, we can now start looking at what mechanisms combine elegantly to, you know, into a robot? We're talking about both, both in terms of function, right? We have an idea of what we probably want our robot to do. So function is very important. But also in terms of volume, right? Your robot is only so much space. Some mechanisms, for example, this guy is an elevator, right? So it takes up minimal volume, whereas this is a double reverse four bar. So this takes up a totally different sweat volume through the robot. So understanding those distinctions um, and being able to communicate with your teammates via whiteboard sketches, 2D, 2D CAD, 3D CAD. This is all um, really important. Um, the other thing I want to mention when it comes to robot architecture is complexity, right? So I like to use degrees of freedom as a measurement of complexity. It's not perfect one-to-one, -one, but it's pretty good. So in general, you can get away with 10 degrees of freedom or less. And if you have more than that, you should really ask yourself why, or you need to do a really good job of justifying it. Um, so this is a, a good example, right? These are two robots from 2018. This is 118. On the other side here is 148. These are both extremely good robots, but one of them has 20 degrees of freedom. The other one has seven, right? So 118 was able to do more robot actions than 148, right? They could reach over the back. They could really precisely place a cube on the scale. They could intake cubes out of the human player station. But ultimately, the, ro the actions that mattered, the scoring cycles that mattered, they were about equal on. If, if not, you might be able to say 148 was faster. Than, um, 
So, you know, prioritize, prioritize accordingly, right? Uh, the other thing I want to mention is there's no hard limit, right? This is just a general rule of thumb. Um, yeah. Okay, so at this point, we should have a solid analysis of the game. We want to, we have a general understanding of how we want to play the game. And we should have a general idea of potential robot architectures that we're interested in pursuing. So from here, we need to figure out how we want to proceed with the rest of the build season, right? And we want to consciously pick one of these two paths. So frequently, the best choice and the faster choice is this upfront architecture where you're, you know, you pick, you pick a architecture and you say, this is what we're going to do. We're not going to prototype all these other potential options. We're just going to do this and we're going to do it as, as well as we can, right? The other option is path two, which is delaying that final architecture, prototyping all kinds of different mechanisms, figuring out which one works the best, and then going back and figuring out your robot architecture based on which solution was the best. Um, in general, you want to use path one as often as you can, as long as you're confident that that mechanism is you know, going to be functional enough, because path one's faster, and the FRC season is really short. So it, you usually want to use path one on most, of your, on most of your mechanisms on your robot, and maybe one mechanism or two mechanisms, you, you go deep and try to figure out what's the most optimal thing, right? <clears throat> so the second part of figuring out how you're going to divide up your team to work on mechanisms is assessing the risk of each mechanism. So I like to think of this in two, two different ways, right? We have the risk of failure. How likely is this to fail? And then the consequences of failure. So this is how bad is it? Is how bad is our uh, is the how bad is the robot going to turn out if this fails, right? So if we have designed an entire robot around this one mechanism, that would be super super high risk, right? And a great example of this would be a drivetrain. So there's a reason that most people say you should never uh, build a swerve drive for the first time in the build season, right? That's because the consequences of failure are super high, and the risk of failure is super high, right? So you're in the red zone. Um, the other thing I want to note is, in general, you shouldn't pursue more than uh, probably two to zero high-risk items. And then you want to pursue as many low-risk items as you can, right? And what that's doing is it's freeing up resources for you to throw at those high-risk those high -risk things that you want to pursue that might give you a competitive advantage. Um, the last thing I want to note with this with this risk, this idea of risk, is um, good teams that have been around for a long time, one of the reasons that they're so successful, they're able to build these crazy complicated robots, is because they're de-risking stuff in the off-season. They're de-risking mechanisms. So you know, a mechanism that for one team might be super complicated, wow, I don't know how we could pull this off. For them, it may be that they've de-risked it, yeah, de it last summer, and now they're comfortable using it, um, incurring very minimal risk. right? So here's an example of 971 kind of managing risk from this last season. So we had initial su success with our suction cup prototype on disks, but it didn't work that well on balls. And what we ended up doing was uh, designing the entire robot architecture around the suction cup intake. We thought it was good enough and potentially enough better than other potential intakes, if we could get it working, that it was worth the risk. Um, and as a result of that, um, we kind of planned our whole season around this, right? We put, a, we put a lot of resources into the suction cup intake, basically all the way through the end of the build season, in order to make sure that it was successful. Um, and that ended up working out really well for us. <coughs> OK, so we have analyzed the game. We have an understanding of how we want our robot to play. We have our robot architectures that we think we might want to pursue. We've selected mechanisms that we want to prototype, potentially. And we kind of have an idea of how, much, how, much, um, how many resources we want to throw at each mechanism. At this point, we're all set up to start prototyping all these different mechanisms. Um, and the first thing I want to emphasize here is that most teams don't do a really good job of documenting their prototyping. So I have found that um, using Google Sheets and then assigning prototypes names is a really good starting point. The reason being, I, I actually picked this up from 148. So instead of calling something Brian's intake prototype, uh, you might call it you know, the Batman prototype. 
some fun name like that. And that disassociates intakes or in, disassociates prototypes from people. So people, um, you know, when that ends up not working out or working out really well, people are less attached to various, various prototypes as we go through the build season. The other thing I want to note is I say track revision numbers, dates, video. The most important things are recording, recording pictures and video. Of, you want to have that captured in a way where you can come back and find it. Um, and then as far as, as far as this area comes, recording goals, constraints, and variables, this is really important for your designers. Once you, once you have um, a functional prototype, what, what is making it so functional, right? It's, um, it's really useful for your designers to be able to go to this document, find, find the numbers that matter, and then execute on a design. Um, what else do I have here? I think that's it. So the next thing I want to mention is I think a lot of teams think of prototyping as this big overarching thing, but I really think it falls into two buckets which are important to distinguish. The first being feasibility prototyping, right? And the question you're asking here is, does this work, right? And this really has kind of a binary success-failure outcome. The second being optimization program, ah, prototyping. Um, and it's really important to distinguish, you know, how well, does, how well can this work? That's um, a very different question from does this work. I want to distinguish that the difference between these is in what you're trying to learn. It's not, necessary, not necessarily in the prototype, right? You could take the same prototype and switch your mindset, and now you're trying to optimize it. Um, two things I want to note, right? Oh, excuse me. So this is a really good example, right? These prototypes look very similar. They're made out of wood. They've got tape all over them. But this one was put together in an hour to test one idea, whereas this other one was iterated on for two weeks, right? And we are, we are changing variables very incrementally, figuring out what works, what doesn't work. Um, yeah, so changing variables that, yeah, OK. Anything else I want to note here? Mm, no. So the last thing I want to, I want to mention for prototyping is you know, there's, a f there's kind of an infamous saying within uh, Team 33, which the original lead mentor said. You know, he, imagine this being said in a, a gruff shop guy, sh old shop guy kind of voice, right? You need stuff to make things. Um, and this goes doubly for prototyping, right? You want to have kind of an inventory of stuff that you can use uh, before the build season starts. So that way, when you get to prototyping, you don't have to worry about how you're going to construct this. You just have to worry about what you're constructing. Right, so a lot of times wheels or things that interact with game objects are not so different year to year. You want to have a lot of that kind of stuff so you can test it on game objects quickly. Um, usually you want stuff that allows you to spin shafts, right? Um, and then you want motors, first planetaries, any of that kind of stuff that you can slap together quickly in order to make, in order to make stuff move. Um, the other thing I like to mention is if you have a router or some way to cut out, maybe you have a jigsaw, um, quarter-inch plywood or two-by-one box tube, that kind of stuff is stuff you want to stock a lot in order to have that kind of baseline uh, prototyping material. The last thing I want to mention is a drivetrain. If you have been around for a year, you'll have an old robot, right? And having a spare drivetrain with all the top taken off that you can attach mechanisms to will make a world of difference in your prototyping, especially when it comes to intaking. Um, intakes where you can move the intake into the game object rather than pushing the game object into a stationary intake. That's a really big difference and sometimes the, the, the nuances there um, will come back, to, come back to bite you if you don't, if you don't uh, address those up front. Okay, so that's all I have for you guys today. Um, I know it was a lot. I was talking quite quickly. So here are some key, uh, key takeaways. The first thing is you want to plan your season with the triangle of robot performance in mind, right? Remember those three key things and make sure you're doing all of them. You can't sacrifice one at the expense of the others. The second thing is use time-based analysis to figure out how the game is going to play, right? You don't have to walk into the competition blind. You can know roughly how many points different robots are going to score. You can understand how your robot's going to perform before you ever build it. The third thing being mechanism risk. Um, you know, one of the greatest um, pitfalls of FRC is over committing to a design, trying to build too much. 
if you understand what, what your resources are and where your risks are on your project, you're going to have a much better time building a robot that ends up being successful at the end of week six. And then the last thing, prototype with intent, right? Make sure you understand what you're trying to, trying to understand when you prototype, and make sure you record it. So that way, later, when you forget the prototype's been taken apart, you can go back and figure out what you were doing. OK, thank you. <laughs> if you guys have any questions, I'm happy to answer them also. Can you mind switching back to the one? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, please. Mm -hmm. Based on aiming towards building the best possible robot, like mm -hmm. the one that's gonna like win world champs and try to be the best that it can. But mm -hmm. for um, teams that are kind of looking for smaller goals, like they know they can't reach that, but they kind of wanna want to figure out what's the best like way to implement whatever they can given their limited resources, expertise, time. Then how would you? Okay, so the question was, um, the golden are the you know the golden rules are for you know if you're trying to be super competitive at the highest level, how might this process change if you are um, uh, less competitive or you know maybe you're only trying to win a district event and, or seed in the top eight, right? You're not trying to win Einstein. So um, let me flip back to those golden rules first of all. So the first thing I want to say is that these golden rules, they're for everybody, right? That's why they're golden. They are, they are the best rules. If you're trying to build a competitive robot, and that doesn't mean a competitive Einstein robot. That means, that means the best robot that you can build with your resources, right? Um, these are rules to live by. Um, and as far as changing this process, I would not change much about this process. Um, when you analyze the game, you're going to have to analyze it in a different way, right? So when you're doing time-based analysis and stuff, you want to care a lot more about, um, you're going to want to go and reference historical robots that are maybe closer to your capac uh, like robot capacity, right? What you might expect. And you can still get a lot of value out of this process if you, as like a middle, I want to say like a 80% team, right? A 50% team, a percentile team. In fact, I might say that, you know, a lot of times the best the best robots or teams, you know, they kind of have to do everything in order to be successful at the highest level, right? Sometimes this process can be more valuable for those those slightly lower resource teams that can't do everything, right? Because you have to figure out which thing is the best thing to do. Because I can only do one thing. Uh, does that answer your question? Okay, excellent. Yep, go ahead. So um, when, you, when you're planning out, for example, time-based value. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the question was, if you're when you're doing time-based analysis, how important is you know like taking into account drivetrain speed and stuff of that nature versus just using historical data? So I would say, um, when you go and look at uh, historical examples, what you'll find is that the time it takes to drive from one area to another area is usually the, the fastest part of a cycle, right? Usually, most of the time is occupied in lining up to stuff, or Scoring. Mostly it's lining up to stuff, honestly, right? So um, in general, so even a full speed, full field sprint is usually like four seconds, five seconds, right? Um, so in general, it doesn't impact the analysis that much, your exact uh, gearing. Anybody else? Sure. Yeah. Anybody? <laughs> I'm curious about how sure. time-based analysis, how does your model match up with what you saw in the competition? Who's the best? Um, remarkably well. So we, uh, 971 primarily cares like about Einstein level play. That's mostly what we focus on. Um, and I think our, our numbers were actually a little short of what the best, absolute best robots in the world do, did, but they were you know, pretty close. So it didn't affect our robot design at all. Um, yeah. Um, the other thing I'll say is you don't necessarily need, um, 
a lot of like those critical lessons uh, are not necessarily dependent on um, how well people play the game. It's more because you're comparing two different op uh, scoring cycles. Um, and you know, if one's inherently more efficient, it doesn't matter how well both robots end up being able to perform them. You know, one ends up kind of always being better than the other. Um, any, anything else? All right, we'll wrap it up. Thank you guys very much. I am Hesat Tasia. I am a student on Team 971. We hope you enjoyed this video. For more videos and resources, please subscribe and visit our website, frc971.org.